So I will tell you something uh, from a perspective of the global distribution, but actually it's a just set of golden rules <laughs> that you have to follow. You know, some of you have heard it many times. It's just you know repeating until you all get it. <laughs> this is uh, these are the sets of rules that like that's a must. Yeah, it doesn't mean that it will success but it will give you a little mm, better insight in our per, uh, into our perspective that we have as uh, distributors working on an international market. Uh, the presentation was initially made, like designed by Eric Reading, but unfortunately he couldn't come. Then we discussed his talking points. Actually, we could record it because it was pretty good material uh, when we were talking about this. But then I come here with his notes, I made this presentation and I will run through it. If somebody doesn't know me, uh, I'm working for eight, the last 80 years as the export manager and the business developer for Rebel. Uh, I'm distributing many titles worldwide, both from Rebel Studio but also sourcing from successful Polish companies that made pretty big Kickstarters. And Eric Reading is an import manager for Asmod the Nordics. So previously Enigma saw one of the biggest and also wholesalers in the, in the region, uh, both distributing localized games and also English versions. Okay, so... We'll talk, as I mentioned, like it's not about like that you will succeed, but without doing your homework properly, you will, in our opinion, absolutely fail. So this is just, uh, this is your handbook. This is like the check, please check all the boxes that I show you. Uh, you have to be aware, uh, you have to be, you have to understand our position here yeah, and how we could help you. So, first, no, it doesn't make sense, this, this slide. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, first, uh, state of the market. Yeah? Uh, we, uh, the current state of the, of the business will give you something more, what are we uh, dealing with and how we, uh, how we have to operate on, on our side. Yeah? So, Competition, yeah, it's like your competition. I mean, the, the the games market is much much bigger every year. Yeah, the the cause of that is probably some of your successes. <laughs> so people are are uh, are not only creating; they were also creating, but they are they are looking for uh, sometimes easy money. Sometimes they think that it's just super easy. So the market is currently flooded. I mean, uh, in the previous years, when I probably entered these, this business like 15 or 20 years ago, depending how, how it looked like, there were just, you know, single releases every month. Yeah? Now we have multiple releases every week. And uh, it's, just, it's just crazy. Yeah? Like, you don't, you have to take in perspective a local store that has a very limited space on their shelves. Uh, because they are our like, bread and butter, they are like our uh, core market and they cannot squeeze in more games into their like, limited shelves and expose them all the all front to the customer. Yeah? Internet has a little better uh, perspective, you, you have a little more space, but still yeah, you, have, you have limited client attention. Huh? So it's not only that you have to present a good game. You have to present a game better that this retailer has already on the shelf so they can like, okay, now I will risk and remove this older, slower rotating title and put in yours. Yeah? So the same on the side of the, of, the, of the distributor that prints their catalog, for example. Yeah? If, we have, uh, if we have like 100, 250, products in our catalog, probably 30% of them won't stand the test of time. We will. We decided that we are no longer producing it, so we can remove this 30% and 
and start looking for their better versions, their better substitutions. But we probably won't substitute our best sellers. Yeah. So like trying to find a, like give Rebel or Asma the distribution a better version of Ticket to Ride won't succeed. We won't even take the risk because we already uh, we already done it. Find if you are trying to design for purpose to substitute a game. Make your research, maybe you and like compare your like be sure what's your strong point here. Yeah, if you're like I'm talking also like disclaimer, I'm talking about like not creating for your own will uh, like uh, on your like for your creative needs. It's just this is like highly like business oriented, yeah. How to put your product on the shelves. And I'm talking only about this motivation. Yeah? So that's it. Games are better, there are more of them. Uh, and the, even if our market is growing year to year, we see the result that like the value of uh, turnover of the whole market is growing. Even if the if the Kickstarter uh, board game tabletop section is stronger every year and uh, like in terms of like 25 30 percent sometimes <laughs> it doesn't mean that there are more successful games yeah uh, like the success rate actually is lower this is this is super important for you that like if the this 100 percent was reached by uh, uh like some limited number of games yeah the next year the success is more or less the same but it spreads among larger number of titles so like the average uh, raised value of the game is lower yeah so there is no like you also see and try to like duplicate the success of the games that you've heard about that had like spectacular successes yeah but it's like these are only the games you've heard about like because they probably invested a lot in marketing you don't hear like the losers don't have the don't have the space to tell their stories. Yeah? So like there are so many unsuccessful releases. There are so many mm, games that shouldn't be even crowdfunded. Yeah, but people people are dragged on this like premise of success that you that is uh, like this they earn so much money. I have better game the, than them. Like. I have I have repaired their ga their game and I cannot launch it now. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, you will be lost in the fog. <laughs> I mean, this is without a proper uh, investment in uh, in uh, social media marketing and general big investment that like returns you money back. And this without that, without good specialists on board, uh, like don't do it. Yeah, I mean. First of all, we, uh, as a, as a as group, we concentrate on the retail distribution uh, and I will concentrate on that. But generally, don't believe that there is a, like easy money on the market. It's not true. There was, yeah, a few years ago. Yeah, well, All these companies that you know like popped out and they grew, they had like the, their golden shot. There is probably still a space for some, you know, new, innovative, successful companies, but you have to be still. So I to imagine that it's no longer a blue ocean, yeah, it's a red ocean, yeah. So like you have to you have to fight for your for your uh, visibility, for your for your space on this market. You know? Yeah, and this means when you have a shelf limited shelf space, the games now have a shorter uh, lifetime. Yeah, so they uh, the warehouses are full of games that haven't sold, haven't been sold. And currently, we don't give the game a second and third chance. Yeah, if we have a game that we bought, like or produced one thousand, two thousand, and we sold an only fifteen or twenty percent of it, we don't reinvest more money into it because we have so many games waiting in line. Yeah, so we just okay, it like let's forget about it. Yeah, win this money back. Yeah. So we sell it at the cost of production or even lower just to get rid of it. Yeah? Especially now, bigger picture. <laughs> previous year was very successful. The end of the previous year was very successful and our main problem was 
to have enough games for this season. Yeah? So we had to reprint fast, we were waiting super long instead of six weeks. Some factories gave us nine months production time. Yeah? So we reordered much more than we needed. All these shipments arrived around February. And then like why every every credit advisor said like that have to be a pandemic and war to make it like <laughs> to make your credit unbearable. So we are here now and and warehouses of many distributors with the people that their credit rate rates like twice sometimes. Yeah? Uh, we have four times more games than we should have. Yeah? So we are we don't even have frozen money, we have to pay even more money to uh, keep like extra warehouses going yeah so and it means that we don't we cannot that much focus on the on a on a on a games like for theirs like others want to have that their games will be taken care of for years yeah but here if it's not if it not sells it's rotten apple right now yeah like super brutal i'm just you know there is no uh, like if we have 200 releases within a year. Store have 500 novelties from all the all the publishers. We don't have that much time to take care of you. Okay, if the game has a very successful start and it has some extra like marketing behind it, it helps us, of course. Yeah, if you are a part of this process, if you provide your own materials, sometimes if you engage your uh, your uh, your uh, your fans. Yeah, but if not, just like just disappears yeah we sell it like just to just to not pay more for storage that we could potentially save money on it yeah so that that's it yeah you have no that there is there is a way i mean there is a there is a problem there is a chance that your games won't be even noticed so uh, and it happens even to very good games this is also the reason why some publishers reject your games because they know that they will have a kind of similar game at the same time, yeah? or they have a heads up from like industry giants like Clubini or not that will have a, exactly the same topic in the same quarter. They cannot like we shouldn't compete. Yeah? Also, within like bunch of Asmata Studios, we also. Sometimes we know at the month of release that like our friendly studio has the same game. I mean, uh, the same theme for also for two players at the same price tag, and it was like survival of the fittest. Only one will stand the test of the market. Yeah. So it happened a few years ago with uh, Apple, uh, like the App Store market. There were like more releases that you can even see daily yeah you can see. it was like in infinite scroll just to see the novelties yeah then it happened with uh, with uh, video games on steam yeah it's just too many you have to you have to use so many filters actually to see only uh, games potentially interesting for you same here yeah the number of releases in Asson, uh, number of releases in uh, in, in stores. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we like in Poland and other markets that are localized from English. Uh, we have this press selection of publishers that take this responsibility on that. Yeah. But try to imagine American market, how many like <coughs> games they're popping out. You just can't filter them out. Yeah. It's it's harder and harder every year. So this is our current state that's why we are not as you know uh, now now eager to just grab a game and publish it yeah and this is this is our way of thinking yeah either marketing efforts some kind of innovation that like <coughs> is behind the game allows us to to give a game some spotlight to give you to gather some interest and um, this is most important part for us now. Yeah? A few years ago, I've heard on uh, this kind of this question. It, it was about video games. If is this game like well streamable? Like, can I use like online streams like Twitch to promote the game? Yeah, uh, does it look good on the screen? For us, it's does it stands out? Yeah, no longer flat games about building German city with a city name in a title is 
that attractive yeah they're flat they're usually use the same palette of colors they have like just you know the points on the edge of the port yeah so like there are, there are fans of this that are probably good games but they it's harder and harder to sell them yeah? so that's why sometimes we ask something yeah you know like can you invent something to make the game stand out yeah can we use like 3d element can we like sometimes miniatures are a good option sometimes not yeah but like like we need a like with the with a generator at Frostpunk. Like we we needed the center piece to that the game will be interesting on the photos from the distance. Yeah, so it will you know when you're passing by you will you will just grab it because the like the cover is dark. So cover is not appealing, but at least <laughs> it's mustard. The, the center pieces, yeah. So like there are some, or or so you can think about like very specific distribution for this game. Yeah? This is also interesting, and many of the recent party game releases are successful because of illustrations. Yeah, controversial sometimes, but looking at exploding kittens, like trial by the trolley and others. Yeah, you have the uh, they are using some already existing pop culture base, a customer base to promote the game. Yeah, and like they're the first they're the first line. Yeah. So how you as a designer can help us and uh, like help us earn money together. Yeah. Uh, so what is successful game? You ask. The definition of success for our purpose is is the game that have been produced three times. I mean, the first print job just covers basic costs. Yeah, the second one is actually profit that was lost on the first production line because uh, on on the first print run because it was like then it makes it equal. The third print run is is a success. Yeah, that's that's a first print run that we really earned some money. So we could share that we could reinvest. In a, in a, in a, in a even bigger marketing because now we know that's battle proven yeah so the first one is just pure investment from both sides yeah and um, it usually goes to the like least demanding uh, uh, distribution channels so hobby stores because they don't ask for that high uh, discounts yeah or some you know even direct sales like Kickstarter sales or Amazon sales that some smaller publishers also do directly. The second print run is the is the usually a f uh, first of one corrected and optimized, cool. so that you have no longer mistakes in the rule book. You no longer you no longer producing like like uh, any mistakes that are on a, on a cardboard. It's somewhere optimized. You have already paid for the tooling. So like it's just like the first reprint revised edition, and there are like first copies that goes to mass market uh, accounts. Yeah, so we can present it. Okay, we are reprinting the game, so we can go to Empic on or other chain. This is good game. Yeah, our clients are reordering it. This is the like the sales results from our 12 months. We can we can continue. We will reprint it, so we can offer it to you at a better price because like the stores are asking for 40 to five to 50 percent discount depending on like numbers whatever. But like Empic starts with minus 60, minus 70 percent sometimes. Like uh, putting all uh, marketing costs and uh, and logistics costs. Yeah. So this is this is much it's totally different client. Yeah. So um, and also like with the, with the following print runs, if it's if it was proven, we have more localiza localization partners worldwide. So it also lowers the uh, lowers the production. Um, a few years ago, the game like this is also like why it's having been reprinted is a uh, is a matter of success. Yeah, a few years ago, like eight. Uh, we had this like if the game is good enough, yeah. I mean, the good enough means one thousand, so we can print it, yeah. Like it's not a problem. We'll sell it eventually. And then the test was like two thousand. Do we really think that it's better than than it was? And like the market grew, so like we can raise the bar, yeah. Then it was three or five thousand. Doesn't matter, yeah. But then it was the question: Would would you? Do you really feel, when I presented a game like found here or at 
the other show, whatever, I asked my boss, yeah, like, do you really feel that you will reprint that game in 12 months? Yeah, if he said yes, that that was the test. Yeah, I mean, it's no longer about printing one run because it's it wasn't profitable. Now we are asking this. Do you think that we will have it? You know, in, in two years. Yeah, also. Yeah? So like this is how the bar was risen multiple times just to filter out the games that are just you know we print them just to keep our cash flow more or less yeah we we invest we get this money back but we don't really have the money for a long term investment from this yeah so we, we are cautious we tend to skip this game. so how's the designer you can minimize our cost uh, uh, cost and maximize your possibility of being your game successful yeah make your client make your game accessible yeah? it's just um, every as they say like every uh, every um, physics equation in a in a uh, in an education book like divides its audience in a half yeah? so uh, also here the the more complex more niche more geeky like heavily geeky game you make, you make this uh, your audience narrower. Yeah? So we are looking for something that's okay, interesting for you as, uh, as creators, you are a very important part of our market, but like many mm, successful games have pretty shitty story behind it. Yeah? <laughs> and they have like very approachable, very easy or even no theme. Because they could be presented at hen or stack parties, at, at pubs, uh, they can be presented in, in in shows. But if the game is good enough, yeah, they have uh, they also can catch your attention. Yeah? Usually dragons and dungeons and all that stuff. Like it's just no, it's only for geeks. I won't buy it for my child. Yeah? I won't get, uh, buy it for a present because like I don't know if my friend like science fiction, yeah? Game with trains or animals is just so much easier to sell, yeah? It, of course, if it's like Marvel or Disney license or this kind of stuff, it's usually easier because you're, you're reaching to a specific audience, yeah? But like, try to, try to make it like not for niche. Language, language independency. <laughs> Is helps you with the start. Yeah, if you if you design your game as a language neutral, uh, it's easier to reach out also to smaller markets that don't always order their own localized version, multilingual ones. And it's also it's pretty important for a potential success of a game that you have a strong audience, even in a smaller like country like Belgium, for example. But they prefer multilingual versions. Yeah. Like, I have my games being sold in Belgium and Canada, multilingual versions, but I have no, uh, but I have, uh, no local partner in, uh, in France, yeah? because they have too many games. Yeah? So for me it's easier to make a French, Dutch and French English version than have a decent French representative. Yeah? So, and generally it lowers the cost of production in so many ways, in reprints, in arranging them, in uh, keeping some like plastic materials in stock. Yeah, so like, and also language neutral design. Often, not always, it's just cleaner uh, that you don't have all the text everywhere. Yeah, if you cannot make a language neutral, try to think if you can make your game a little bit simpler. Maybe it's just like if it's like, okay, you don't have to do it, but just ask that question and answer it. Yeah. So the cost. Yeah? You don't have to make your game much more expensive than it should be. Uh, that is uh, all this component bloat, yeah, that like you're, you like to put some extra stuff. But on our side, as we get the game into development, we try to rip off all these unneeded components to make the price lower. Why? Because there are so many uh, um, cost-sensitive markets. Poland as well, yeah, uh, but, but with super expensive games you can reach your customers via like Kickstarter uh, because they are used to pay a lot but generally if the game has only needed co components I mean only these components that that give the 
best uh, best experience. Yeah, you shouldn't cut the things that are like very important, the gameplay or some kind of you know give it some other advantages, but just don't give like you know card holders with something that are like expensive that are not standard. Please use standards as well because it helps us to, 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 to save some money on the production. But generally, don't make your game unnecessarily overpriced. Yeah? Trends. Try to find a theme that is interesting for you, a little bit more innovative. But at one point, when you see too many games with the same theme, it's just you are like making a crowd in your sector in already crowded market. Yeah. So like next game about like Slavic mythology with a guy with swords killing these monsters is just really like please stop. I have one already. Yeah, yeah, I have I have probably you know like not a ripoff of it. Yeah. So like don't try to copy. Try to be innovative, yeah, but also try to avoid like super niche or controversial titles, yeah? like titles themes. Yeah? If something could be like no no for a ethnic group because it it's <laughs> it's uh, it's it's stigmatizing, if uh, so it, it could cause really unneeded attention for everyone. Or if it is just you know the if you make this game just unreachable by some by some clients or just disgusting unnecessarily yeah uh, then just stop <laughs> then just stop like try to make it lighter yeah still I'm talking about potential mass market customer yeah I'm talking about global distribution if you want to make something uh, controversial for a small group do it on your own <laughs> do it on kickstarter then maybe you will find that many people to print it okay. yeah. but don't address it to uh, to the distributor that usually reaches the white market yeah. and um, find a good publisher for your game yeah it's um you can at the early stage already think about it who would be your potential end customer uh, your and and the best brand for that game yeah if there are some authors that have like very good relationships uh, or like you can use agency for that and yeah? that will advise you yeah but like try to find someone yeah like uh, saying here yeah I'm asking a question like what is your uh, what is your dream of a publisher logo on your box yeah? make it this dream list yeah sometimes like having it in mind helps you a little bit yeah? and that you, have, you can have better references this kind of stuff and uh, if you don't now go to a local store yeah? this is that's the question I ask if I have a game I'm looking for a partner in a new territory sometimes I go for a business trip uh, and I talk with the multiple distributors but after talking with them I have their like first feedback I go to a local store like the that they recommended me and I'm talking with a with a with a store owner hey I have this game wanna play yeah okay I was looking for distributors here yeah but who in your mind would be best for it and why yeah it really helps me but also this question you could ask you, you your gaming group or your local store at your local store because they know probably more about the publishing line maybe some you know uh, upcoming releases the the so it will help you especially guys probably doing these kind of games every year can give you better development in this in this specific area yeah? so like rebel has a different spe specialization than lookout or or some french studios yeah like try to find a like you know good match for you yeah uh, many years ago, at the one of first uh, game laboratories, uh, Philip Michuinski said, "Like the game is not uh, uh, not uh, like uh, uh, it's not like a black dress. Not everyone looks good in it. <laughs> I mean, you, you need to find the best publisher that will fit your uh, feature game, and vice versa." Yeah? 
So, you need network. Yeah? So, uh, it's very good that you are here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good step in building a network. Uh, build a network also with the reviewers, yeah, with the local stores, with the, with the local testing groups or testing groups from other cities that you can visit from time to time. Uh, take part in uh, like uh, online TTS testing, the, gru the group that Bishop is running or many others. Find friends, <laughs> build a coalition. <laughs> I mean, it's like your strength is your network here. Yeah? I'm a networker and look where I am. Yeah? So, no, just, <laughs> no, it's, just, it's just super important. Yeah? If you, you cannot be renegade in this society. I mean, you shouldn't be. Yeah? Uh, if you do, just do it smart. But, like, yeah, you, you, have to, uh, you, have to, you have to build this connection of people that you can trust and they will trust you. Huh? Uh, persistence. <laughs> so, uh, your games will be rejected. Yeah? Try to imagine that, like, probably you, maybe 20% of your submitted games will get a chance. Yeah? Like, even presenting them to publishers, agencies, or directly to customers. This is the success rate that you have to estimate right now. Yeah? Especially if you don't have your strong personal brand. Huh? So uh, be persistent. I mean, in reaching your goals, like getting proper feedback from your testers, listening for a feedback from your uh, potential publishers. If they say no, ask them why, but not like just to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, that's that's very problematic also with the communication. We say you why the game is bad. I mean, what should be corrected? And the, you return sometimes like, oh, I've corrected this and that. It's still probably not the game for us. Yeah, I would just give you some feedback in general. It doesn't mean that we take the game automatically after you you repair it. It's sometimes it's just you know it's obvious for us that it's a broken mechanic. Yeah, but. Uh, Look for a feedback, and if you get it, like try to try not to be persistent in like forcing the same game every every few months to the, to the publisher, but to be persistent in reaching your goals and dreams. But if like multiple publishers and fellow people in the industry tell you that it's not good enough to be published, lesson learned. Put it somewhere, yeah, or recycle it to to <laughs> to, to good uh, to uh, components for a new prototype, and start from the scratch. It's usually better, yeah. If you want to keep some good aspects that many people told you, oh, this game is shit, but this like card drafting, the like or the theme is unique, yeah. Keep it, yeah, but like make it in a a new game around it because you probably like yeah just. Just try to, uh, yeah, try to listen for it. And we are we are rejecting sometimes because we think that it won't get this like second and third reprint. Yeah, it doesn't mean always that it's a bad game at all, but like it's just unsellable. Maybe for your own sake, make a print and play. Yeah? Just you know, document that you have done this. Yeah. Maybe you will get a new feedback, or some publisher will ask you to retheme it for their, uh, for their, you know, specific license or this kind of stuff. Yeah? Or maybe the new uh, designer will look at your print and play. Hey, I can I can help you. I have new ideas. Let's collaborate. Yeah. So this is there are so many options yeah? instead of just you know throwing it in a in a bag without anyone's uh, with, without saying it to anyone. And publishing, yeah. So there are there is a wide array of, of options, yeah. Maybe someone will pick it up eventually. Yeah. Uh, so, and like we as publishers uh, had to learn that like publishing games out of pity or out of like you know personal <coughs> friendship is the worst possible scenario for both sides. You are convinced that you can still produce shitty games and we will lose money. Our customers, our stores 
we lose trust that we gave our brand to a game that's like mostly unplayable, yeah. And this is like really worst scenario for everyone, yeah. Or I've heard about even worse scenarios that the uh, author decided to publish it on their own without having uh, any distribution network. Yeah, so they had a credit or they lost their family money and then anyhow the games had to be recycled <coughs> at the end. Mm -hmm. So just just don't do it. it. Too many people tells you that it shouldn't be published. Maybe there is something. Yeah, just just try to listen to this. Just make contacts and um, and within this networking, if you're way like if you're if you're would like to publish the game, just calculate costs, ask people for their needs. Yeah, you are um, at this moment you have to like. Um, stop acting as the artist or a creator you are here working as a craftsman and a business person if you're not good at it ask your best friend or uh, some kind of representative but generally um, I, we have to agree that we are talking about the same thing yeah? publishing if you want to do the artsy stuff do it without publishers involved yeah they will pick it up later, but just don't lo let's not lose each other's time. Yeah, so like you probably know this. I found it in the original version. So I I told you what you have to do, what you have to do. Yeah, you have to have idea, some experience. Then you put hard work. Like the original work had, had the tiredness, but like at the end it could be just shit. It could be just unplayable game yeah even if you put your heart your experience your best resources your friends feedback and hours of hard work yeah it still won't work at some point yeah so don't worry this is 80% of our world yeah <laughs> so so really don't worry because you would need luck at the end yeah the luck is uh, like you can help your luck. Yeah? The more you invest of uh, uh, the more of the in your experience, your work, your like all these um, and all these lessons learned here or at other places, yeah, it will your success would be less dependent on that luck. Yeah, but generally in every trade. <laughs> in every business, in every market, the luck is involved. You don't know about other publishers, about other uh, about other uh, authors, yeah? what they are planning to do. You don't, like, even if you have a like, spectacular game, yeah? if you have a release at the same time, when a bigger publisher has a, have the same idea and their game is five euro cheaper, you will lose, yeah? and you have no control. So, thank you. Thank you.